Welcome to the Riot Podcast, where we have practical discussions on how to share your faith, see the news from God's eyes, and answer some of faith's hardest questions. Welcome to the Riot Podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Barry Rice. Hey, 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 everybody. How you doing today? We're so excited to have you. And Mac Daddy Pete Robertson. Yes, that's my name. And I am Bob Shoneman. Don't I, worry I right forgot out. to tell my own name. Yeah. Hey, Wait. Hey. We need to thank Barry for uh, setting up a really amazing tour last week. That was that was amazing. That was surreal, man. Yeah, I had the best time. I really did. It was really cool. So a lot of people probably don't know this. There's this place in Orlando called the Holy Land Experience, and uh, they're shutting it down. And uh, you know, but we got an opportunity, and I'll let Barry kind of set the stage for it. But he. Through some connections and some friendships, um, he got a phone call. Said, "Hey, would you like to see this one last time before we shut the doors down?" And and we got to do that, and it was really really cool. So I want you to kind of set that up a little bit, and then we could talk about what we got to see. What is a scriptorian? Uh, a place where <laughs> the scriptures are. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of the parts of the Holy Land, they they uh, used to do shows that that really brought to life the Bible. Uh, is that they have a collection of it's it's one of the world's greatest collections very rare stuff of bible artifacts so um bible written on clay bible written on papyrus uh, all that kind of stuff but a scriptorium is a place where they put on display some of the rarest uh discoveries of the bible and and uh one of, what what was your favorite there pete it was i think this is mr van campen's collection and i think we saw what he said like five yeah, percent of that total blew collection me away yeah. Told, mark said three to five percent yeah and it was it was really cool the way they did it so they had it where they started like 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 seven well actually one of the the scrolls was one century a uh, first century it was in the first century they couldn't open it because it had crumble but they had a first century scroll there um, they've had some seventh century stuff and, and different things, but it went through the different centuries. So it started with the scrolls and like you were saying, what was that called? The, um, the clay tablets, um, it starts with a C, right? Yeah. Cortic, Cortic uh, or something. I don't know. People are listening. They're, they're saying it out right now, <laughs> yeah. but they had that. And then it went through the different, you know, the handwriting of the monks and went through the story of the backing of the monks and, and how the monks hand wrote every single one. That's all they did all Incredible. day long. Yeah, and the, you can read it. Their penmanship was incredible. It was like, you know, all these Bibles, all these books, all these scrolls, and they're sitting there handwriting the whole thing. And then they did, like, art on some of them. Like, some of them, they were, like, creative yep. art on it. It was yep. incredible. It just blows me away. That was, I mean, people's job was to copy the Bible absolutely word for word perfectly and he he was saying you know if they messed up on a page they just had to kind Throw of start up. over rip yep. it up start Completely over right? threw it away yeah it's just you know amazing and you were right like it, it looked like it was better than a typewriter i mean yeah. the print was so perfect it just it just blows me away the tedious work that that it would drive me nuts i'd be like 20 minutes and my hand would be shaking <laughs> i'd be ready to move on but man it was really really cool they had the Martyr's Bible, you remember yeah. the Martyr's Bible, where you could actually still see the blood on it. And he was telling the story about, I don't remember who this Bloody was. Mary. Bloody Mary, thank yeah. you. She was a witch. She yeah. was a witch. And she would. She hated oh, Christians. She hated Christians. And yeah. she would take their, they caught them with a Bible, right? They would, they would like execute them and then dip the Bible in their blood and then yeah. throw it into a fire. And yeah. I guess one of the Bibles missed the fire and they, it was saved or preserved somehow. And so and, you could um, see the blood. So that yeah. was in the 14th century the 13th century some 14th century man don't quiz me i think on that. so I, it was I, right I was around there attention yeah, i yeah. promise but there was so we have a picture so much it. information it was <laughs> but it, it was cool because i mean it, and mark was our tour guide and he kind of told us a couple times he's like you know this is kind of the walk through the english bible right so kind of how, how we got to the english bible today and it was there's some really some really cool stuff all the way up into the early like the 1700 of, of the uh the early american church and things like that it was i was blown away i didn't know that that was in our the backyard Geneva bible and, yeah yeah and a lot of Wycliffe stuff and mm -hmm. you know the, one of the oldest things that they had was 2300 years before the birth of Christ crazy that, that was that the cylinder yeah that was Babylon cylinder yeah, yeah oh, Nebuchadnezzar yeah song. Nebuchadnezzar yeah. yeah that was really crazy stuff man but it was really eye-opening and the respect of God's word and the preservation of God's word there there has never ever been any book that's been preserved like the Bible you know the copies that we have in 
still today because it was so precious and so many people uh, or priests copied the Bible. And there's so many copies out there. Yeah, they were so. saying that. So Plato's, um, what was his name of his poem, the famous one? I forget the name of it. Anyway. Oh, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Okay, anyway, I'm drawing a blank too. It was 500... 500 they Iliad. found yeah yes, Iliad that's yeah it. and so they found they found an actual uh writings for about 500 years after he wrote it right and what he was saying is that we have papyrus we have scripture that was in the first century that's right up and not only do we have one we have thousands thousands and in how you look at it from that time to where our scripture is today and it's the same it's been copied the same. It's exactly how it was then. And so it's it's just, it's fascinating. But again, it they, they made this emphasis that God's word prevails. God's word never, never fades away. It just continues to keep on keeping on. And that, what we saw was a testimony to that. From the first century all the way to today, it's God's word and it's still, still standing strong. Yeah. So what you're saying, Pete, is that in some of the books that we really refer to as being ancient historical documents that we don't have the earliest copy we have is 500 years after it was written but the bible we have you know 100 years yeah. or before 100 years it was written we have copies in the first century 10 years after it was yeah. written so yeah. it's really yeah, amazing the, the fun part about it though too is that we got to hang out and we got to take pictures together. Yeah, that's always fun. Yeah, we did some really funny pictures. I think we need to put that up. I think we need to show that in this I don't show. like pictures. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but guys, one of the things I have to I have to admit, it was heartbreaking. Here's a 50-some million dollar yeah. Oh, yeah, building that have been built. Yeah. And they were so beautiful. I mean, anybody uh, ministering in those buildings or working in those buildings would love to be in them because all these columns so intricately done and then and then all the gardens were beautiful with even even though they haven't been kept up there were beautiful the water fountains and and statues everywhere but it's going to be absolutely knocked down man yeah this is the holy land so if anybody have ever been to orlando florida they there's a thing there called the holy land experience and and it's been shut down so since covid of last year they haven't they just shut it down because it just it pretty much wiped them out and so now they've let it go so nobody there's been no shows since i think april of last year they said or something like that march, march of last year and so here it is is a magnificent building they have a coliseum they have like you were saying the grounds the, all the structures the roman kind of feel feels like you're going back into another world and all of that, and that's where the scriptorium was being held. So they had shows there at one point. They had, you know, a whole a whole big event, basically. You were able to take communion. You were able to be baptized there. I mean, it's pretty surreal. They had a garden tomb, right, where the, the, yep. the stone was rolled away. I mean, it was just a whole experience. But that's where the scriptorium was, and it was. It's Arden. I mean, we were just saying, where are they going to put these statues? Who's going to take them? We'll take them. Where is where's this stuff going? I mean, because yeah. there was just a amazing stuff there. I got a truck. I could throw one right. on the back of a truck. <laughs> well, I'd rent a U-Haul, man. I don't care. I'll get whatever yeah. it takes. Keep... They're giving that stuff away. We'll figure it out. They had a replica, I think, of the like the caves where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls too, right? Yeah. That, I, I think Qumran, the Qumran Qumran yeah. Scrolls, yeah. But Barry, I felt like you did. It was so part of me was like in awe of looking at everything, and I mean, I've been I've been to uh, to Israel and you know seen some of these places firsthand, but it was still it was just kind of still felt like man, this is really awesome. And then part of me was just heartbroken. Like, why is you know. Man, it just seems like there should be a way to save this place, right? And man, so that's kind of where my heart was as well. It, you know, it just made me think of this. We need to do a show just on the Qumran scrolls. We need to talk about it. So if you go to Israel in a place called Masada, and it's north, it's up in the the other region, and there's you know it's all desert area. They have a that, where the Qumrans. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's where all of these scrolls were. If anybody's out there listening to this, and just do research on the Qumran scrolls, it'll absolutely blow your mind how perfect perfect these scrolls were to what we read today and this is before Jesus's time many of them or during that time these scrolls were there and it's it's just again proof positive 
that the word of God is true, that it's that people have been living by this word for so long. Um, but look it up. Search the Kumran Scrolls. If there was a book by Michael Heiser called Unseen Realm that goes into the book of Enoch and it goes into some of these scrolls that were found. It's just fascinating. Uh, but it's really deep in my faith, just learning a little bit about it myself. And so, uh, but yeah, anyway, I don't know. I just thought of that. That was fun. Yeah. So that was a great experience. Thank yeah. you, Barry, for setting that up oh, for us. Oh, my privilege. That my was privilege. awesome. So a little bit different show this week, Pete. You want to talk talk to our our, our folks a little bit about what we're going to do today? Yeah, hey, we, this is going to be fun, guys. Yeah, so there's, I mean, we get people, well, we could tell what our most popular shows are based off of how people respond to it. Sure. And we have some shows that there's, you know, over 10,000 listeners have responded to it or listened to the, that program or so forth. And we're going to we're going to take some of these shows and we're going to mash them up and and we're going to present them so we can hear just different clips of of Barry's highlights and and Bob and I will try to keep up keep right. up with them yeah, right. and and, so, and we're going to put Barry's that together highlights. and I can't wait to hear it because we listen to the show yeah. at back and I'm blown away by it and I'm just like I don't remember ever saying that yeah. you know, every week I don't it's remember crazy. you Bob telling them that I, I was know. such a blessing you know that kind of thing that happens and so I'm really looking forward to hearing and we're not going to do it we have we're not going to have any say in how this happens we're letting the staff the team do this and they're going to pick the highlights based off of these 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 shows and uh, so i just can't wait to hear have it. at it guys yeah so you guys are going to you guys are going to enjoy this show i promise you and we love to hear your responses from it but don't forget uh, to go to riotpodcast.co if you have any questions um you want to follow us on social media um, and, uh, and if you've given your life to the Lord, I'm sure we'll have one of those, but please respond to us, go to riotpodcast.co, go to no God, click on the no God page menu bar at the top. And it's just, let us know that you've given your life to the Lord. Um, but we love to hear you. We it, listen, if you guys are on social media, I just thought of this, sorry, if you're on social media and you see us and there's people that are just absolutely berating us and they're coming at us because we get a lot of hate. You guys got to understand this. If you follow <laughs> us on Facebook or anything, you're going to see there's a lot of hate. Still Stick up for us, man. Where yeah, are you guys on. at? Where are you guys at? <laughs> we need some people, some love out there, man. Start fighting for Jesus. Put on your full armor first, yeah. though, please. Yeah. Yeah. Do it in love. Do it in love. Absolutely. <laughs>
there's an urgency that God wants us to live that the that the rapture is is imminent. It, it can happen at any moment, and to be prepared for it. And you know, uh, the other thing is they they didn't have TV, right? I mean, they could not imagine how how we're going to be lifted up. You know, Jesus kind of just ascended to the heavens, and and the disciples saw him ascend to the heavens, and the clouds kind of hear him, and the angels said. You know why are you looking up in the air? We got to go to work. Mm -hmm. We gotta we gotta make disciples because he's coming back and he's gonna come back in the same way. You know, and uh, you know the mystery is is when it's how how are we all gonna be raised, but then how we're we gonna be changed. We're gonna have a new body. We're yeah. gonna have a a a a new uh, physical form that that we can be in the air right we don't we don't need to worry all the astronaut stuff right, right. and that we can be in heaven we're going to be absent from sin we're not going to yeah. have any sin score on us we're not going to have even the scent of sin on us Ooh. the glorified body is is doing away from the power the presence and and all of sin yeah and that's going to be powerful Again, so after Israel defeats, just imagine what happens. So after Israel defeats the this army, okay, the rest of the world are going to stand in awe. So this is what God says in Ezekiel 38, 9. He wants the world to know that he's God. So they're going to be going like, how in the world did this little nation on its own just obliterate this mega huge army, five, six of the army? How is that possible? And God is going to say, because of me. And so there's going to be peace at that very moment in Israel. So there's going to be a, um, there's going to be something where people are going to like, hey, we need to make friends with Israel. We need to, let's make a tree, a peace treaty for Israel. And we believe that is the open door for the Antichrist to come in. It sets the stage. It sets the stage. And so the rapture happens, the gap in between the rapture and this taking place, this invasion of Israel, this Magog defeat come in against Israel, the God stepping in again, wiping out everybody. And now the Antichrist comes on the stage and he says, hey, Israel, let's make a peace treaty. You know, and then at that time, it opens up the door for the temple to be built. Because now the Muslim countries that were coming against them before are like, dude, we're not coming against them. Go ahead, man. You guys are the powerful force. Or You're they've the been destroyed in the, in the, you know, with Russia. Yeah, or they were destroyed. And so now the temple can be built. And we've been told that the temple could be built in 12 months or 10 months. I mean, it'd be, wow. they already have the plans. They already have, they have already been wor working towards the temple preparation. You know, you move on and read in Ezekiel 40, Ezekiel 41, 42, it's talking about this new temple, 43. It's going to be talking about it laid out. Well, the the we don't need the temple in the church here because the Bible says that our bodies are the temple, that God and Christ lives within us, so we don't. It says that we can come boldly into the throne room of God. But once our the Holy Spirit is removed, the church is removed, the temple is now needed. The sacrifice is going to come back. And so because it's going to be as is before Christ came, the Holy Spirit is going to move and act as an agent as he did before. But now Israel's back in play. It's now the, that's now coming in. So that's where the peace treaty comes in. The Antichrist will set up stage there in Israel, the center of the universe. And then after three and a half years, we'll get into that. That's when the Antichrist says, I'm so good. I'm like, God, check out all this peace that I've done. One world government, everything is going great. And that's when the Israelites' eyes were going to be open at that moment. They are going to see him as a fraud. They're going to see fake news right in front of them. And their eyes are going to be open. And Israel, at that very moment, will see that Jesus is the Messiah. They will see that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. At that moment, they will know that Christ was it the whole time and that they were deceived. And they will be embarrassed and they will come humbly before God's throne and plead for mercy and grace. It's Psalm 23. There you go. Man, it's it's six verses, but it is so deep. Yeah. And there and and like you were saying about the oil, I didn't understand that either. So I, I looked it up and it was it's something to do with there was this this was bug that gets into their eyes or into their ears Both. And, and, and will kill the sheep. Yep. So that's what the oil is there to protect them from the enemy, right? That's Come, it. Uh, an enemy that you can't even see. Yeah. Just I mean, there's just so much 
I talk about it being deep, but Psalm 23 is powerful. Man, powerful. You could, I mean, literally six verses. You could, you could probably preach a sermon for like three weeks yeah. on six verses. Mm -hmm. I mean, because there, there's that much so there. Much to what is this a sign of? It's a sign of me being under the control of my flesh and not under the yielded control of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for a way out. That's what it is. Yeah. And when I go back to my old way is I'm entertaining the comfort. I'm entertaining the pleasure of sin. And I'm tempted and I'm giving in a little bit and I, and we're tasting it. We took a bite of the uh, fruit and, and we're tasting it. Mm, yeah, I remember now that's good. And that is such a huge warning sign. I, I'm going to warn you that uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but we kind of touched on it, but you have no idea. You just cannot hardly imagine how much the enemy hates you. Yeah. He really hates you. Why? You know what you've done? God created you in his image. Yeah. And so every time you start to uh, illuminate more of the image of God and more of the greatness of God in you, he hates it and he wants to attack and he wants to rob you. He wants to get you in the flesh. He wants to make you carnal. And because you will not be powerful and impactful with your ministry because you're in the flesh. And, and that is, is what is resurfacing is that he's got you distracted again. When uh, you look at Paul's writing in Ephesians five and he says, do what is the wise thing? Yeah. That, that's such a great question to ask. Is this the wise thing to do? and health-wise, for my family, for my future decisions. Yeah, all things might be lawful, but all things are not the very best thing to do. And again, it's just like alcohol. Once you start opening up that door, you're now susceptible to so many things that Satan can use against you. And once you're impaired, you don't know. There's certain things you might do that you realize you didn't, you did, that you shouldn't have done. You might say something. You might sleep with somebody. You might do the next worst thing, you know? And so it's stay away from it. If you're if you're trying to justify, if you justify anything to that's make a warning it, sign, right that's there. a warning sign. Yep. If you if someone come com, confronts you on something and you have to justify your, then that there's no truth there. Yeah, that should be a red flag. Yeah, so just know that people don't give Satan a foothold. I heard heard it said once. You give him a foothold, and that's where he where he creates strongholds. So we yeah. don't want to open up that door. So a defensive player would be, so you would be the person that would be reading your Bible daily. You would be the person that prays often. You would be the person that goes to church. You would be the person that goes to your Bible study and so forth. And the reason why you're doing that is that you're, you're putting yourself in a position to protect against the enemy. Okay, so that's your defense. So if you're reading your Bible, you you want to know the Word of God in your heart. You want to know the Word uh, in your mind, and and so that you can use your Word to to combat against anything that's coming against you. So that's your defense. The prayer, same thing. You're praying, God, I want to hear from you. I want to talk to you. You're 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 having that fellowship with God. You want to have your defense. Um, when you go to Bible study in the middle of the week or whatever, that's your defense because let's face it, you know you're going to be beat up throughout the week. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen. And so you want to be in around, you know, Bible study and other people. So you want to have that. So that's your that's your defense. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of the mindset. And so a lot of these, a lot of times, what we talk about is we talk about being on the defense. And and when you hear us talk a lot, we're always saying read your Bible and and we encourage you to be in church and we encourage you to you know be in fellowship and to talk and encourage other people and so forth. Um, but what we don't really talk about as enough is to be on the offense. And, and what it means to be on the offense, if you just look at the command of God, go into all the world and preach the gospel, okay? If you look at Acts 1, 8, that we are to go to our, our Jerusalem, our Judea, to our Samaria, and to ends of the earth, and, and we're to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, the command of God was to be on the offense. The command of God was we are to, to go into the world, be the light into the darkness, and to share God's truth. 
And so the offense is, is we, we, we got to be mindful that we are in a spiritual attack. We got to be mindful to, to meet the, the enemy where it's at and, and where he's at and then attack him. You know, we attack them by certain things. And that's something that we can talk about. If you want to talk about the four ways that we can attack uh, the, the enemy or, or offense or Barry, if you have some thought on that. Yeah, how do we attack the enemy? You know, uh, one of the things on my heart is I want to remind uh, everybody, a lot of people that listens to this knows about this, but we planted a church called Go Church. And I think a very offensive verse is, Go ye therefore in all the nations and make disciples. It, it's not sitting back. It is going after people to lead them to Christ and, and don't stop there. Don't stop there. Don't just rescue them from the pit, but help them to get well and healthy and on fire for Jesus Christ. It is the only way his kingdom can be advanced through making disciples. And that's the truth. Religion makes you feel like God owes you. Hmm. If we buy into the idea that righteousness is something we can achieve, then we will ultimately believe that God owes us. Sure, we may come not come to that right away or say it out loud, but we will believe it. This mentality will cause us to question God. Because, you know, why would God allow something bad to happen to someone who follows his rules? Bad things happen because we live in a world cursed by sin, and an idea that God owes us anything is in complete opposition to the gospel. Wow. The Bible plainly says that no one does good before God and that our salvation is only made possible by the grace through faith by grace through faith so that no one may boast. God doesn't owe us anything because he has already given us everything when he died on the cross for our sins. Ah, that's so good, Bob. That puts it in perspective made right away. I mean, it's I mean, we think a lot of times I'm just thinking of my personal life. Let's just go back. And so when I'm doing really good and I'm I'm living a life that I think is holy or whatever. I mean, again, I'm just deceived a lot of times thinking that I was living holy when I really wasn't. But I feel like, okay, when something bad happens to me, the first thing that I say is, well, why, God? I mean, ain't I doing this? Ain't I living a good life? Ain't I going to church and tithing? And I'm doing everything you told me to do. But uh, you still, this is happening. This is, this is the, this is still happening in my life. And I don't understand it. And and so it's 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 having the wrong perspective, and that's a religious mindset. And the right perspective is it's it's never about you. Right. It's always about God. The right perspective is, all right, God. Well, what is it that you're asking of me to do? The right perspective is I have an eyes to see and ears to hear. The right perspective is, are you adjusting your life to fit what He's doing? It's not about that's Him good, condemning Pete. you. It's about what is God asking of you to do in this moment. It might be to, he might be saying, hey, I need you to come rest in me and come spend time with me and, and worship me because I haven't heard from you in a while. That's a relationship. Religion is saying, I did this and so I deserve this from you, God. I, I did this and so you owe me. You're not a good God because you're allowing this to happen. And God's saying, no, I am a great God. I desire to have a relationship with you. I desire to know you intimately. I desire to bless you and to further and bring favor in your life. I don't desire to condemn you. I don't desire to do that. We have the wrong perspective if we're living a religious life that you owe me. You know, that makes me think of Isaiah 7, 14. And it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. What is he talking about that? The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Mm. You know, what is that sign all about? It's the sign of the Messiah. Mm. It's a sign of his love. And and what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. Mm -hmm. Can you mean the can you imagine the audacity of the creator of the universe, the God of all coming down in the flesh to be amongst us as people? I mean the love in that and, and demonstrating this love and, and especially demonstrating it on the cross. And and when you think about John 3 16 it says that God is the greatest giver and he's given the greatest gift for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life hmm. so I mean what a gift for God to show up on earth to humanity 
and to take upon flesh and blood humanity himself so he could relate to us. Hmm. And you know, I uh, I preached on that this past Sunday, the incarnation of God taking up flesh and how if he didn't take upon flesh, how would he have been able to suffer? How would he have been able to die? He would not have. And if he wasn't God, how would the sacrifice, the gift of him sacrificing on our behalf, how would it be acceptable? It wouldn't be. So he had to be 100% man to be able to suffer. And he had to be 100% God so that the, the offering would pay for all of humanity for all of eternity. I mean, there's no greater gift than that. You know, I was just thinking, you, you mentioned Isaiah 7, 14. It, that's, that's in the Old Testament. That's before Jesus ever came. That's, that's probably the, one of the more remarkable things about Jesus. I think he was, uh, there was prophecy like 300 and something times that he was prophesied about coming up back to the earth or coming to the earth. I mean, what, in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And, and it's like, you know, when you really start studying the history of Jesus and his birth, and you start studying the prophecy of his birth, I mean, it just blows your mind because the, the chances of all of this coming fulfilled is absolutely impossible. And, and, uh, and it has to be an act of God. And so the significance of his birth is even more grand than, and than we can possibly think or imagine. I mean, it's, this is a very big deal, you know? And I was just thinking of, of you know where god created the heavens and the earth he created us from the very beginning and, and he says i love you know man it's good that he created man and then he says i just want you to love me and have fellowship with me you know that was what god wanted you know i want to have fellowship with you i want to have you know i want to i want to live with you and, and talk with you and, and and be with you and then he says but i don't want you to eat the fruit i don't want to you know there needs to be a perfect holy union here and he wants to, to have that fellowship, but man chose to sin, chose to separate themselves from God. And so ever since that time, God has been pursuing man. God has been saying, and he's been giving them opportu man opportunity after opportunity to repent of their sins, to have that fellowship with them. And man kept pushing God away. If you start studying all of the Old Testament, you start studying history in general, man was constantly saying no to God and wanting to serve their own selves and not have that perfect fellowship with God. Again, I think man maybe thought that God was a, not a good God and that he wanted control or certain things, but they didn't really know the God of the Bible. They didn't know that, no, God is a gentle, kind, loving God. And he loves us so much that he then said, I need to step in. And he sent his only son to sacrifice because life is in the blood. And that's why Jesus gave, that's why God gave the sacrifice, the sacrifice of the lamb or whatever. But he knew that in order to give life, you must get, take life. And he must have, the sacrifice was in the blood and the blood is, gives life. And so that's what happened. And so he gave his son. He said, I'm going to send my son to live the perfect life as I did. I'm going to give you the roadmap. I'm going to give you all the things, all the tools necessary to live a life that's in fellowship with me. The Bible actually says because of Jesus, we can now come boldly into a throne room. We can actually have communion with him. We can actually have fellowship directly with the Father. We don't go through anybody else. But that is that that really you know boils it down. I mean, when we look at Christmas, and we and we see that there's this birth of this child, we must understand that it completely changed time. Man was going to hell. Man was being destroyed. There's no way that man can have any presence uh, in God's presence. They can he could not in, enter into His presence. There was sin. There was defilement. There was destruction. And God loved us so much that he says, no, I want to save man. I want to provide a way for man. I want to give them an opportunity to come to me again, to have fellowship with me. I want to be their God. You know, remember in Garden of Eden with Adam and, uh, Adam and Eve is, is God took care of everything. He clothed them. He provided food for them. He gave them shelter. He took care of them. And that's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's the same God that we serve today. And so I was just thinking from Christmas, I mean, this is, this is, not, this is not about buying the presents. Mm. This is not about, hey, let's see how much we can get or, or, or even blessing people. This really is about giving thanks to God for doing this. 
really about just getting on our face before him and worshiping him for this opportunity that we have now to have eternal life with him for all eternity. So, but we're just hearing, we're being just bombarded with uh, negative all the time. And I think that fear kind of plays into even the decision to take the vaccine. And I know we're gonna talk about this next week, but I think that kind of plays into part of um, of the fear factor, right? People don't know what to believe anymore. Everything, there seems like yeah. you, you can't believe anything you see on the news or anything you read. Everything mm. seems to be skewed politically. So it just makes, I think it's just a challenge. And I think that's now playing into this vaccine, which you could argue is a miracle. Um, you know, we talked about this this morning in our in our show prep that, uh, you know, the, the average time for a vaccine to come to market over the, you know, the last hundred years is about 10 years. It usually takes eight to 10 years to get it to market. In fact, the record was four years. And, you know, we, we first heard about, or I don't know about you guys, but I first heard about COVID about nine months ago, 10 months ago, right? Kind of the end of February. No. And we started kind of, this thing started kind of coming out a little bit and then the whole world shut down in March. But I mean, it's been nine months and uh we have a we, vaccine we have a vaccine yeah and, and and multiple vaccines not just one vaccine so <laughs> this is either you know it's a miracle or it's something else so or they've been working on it for a while and, or they've been working on it for a yeah. while so maybe that's something we could talk about a little bit next week as well so what, um, what i'm seeing from my people guys is that there is so much confusion from what they're getting from just normal media and it's so skewed and it's so warped that the people that they're going to check out their story with are are taking the the rebuttals to such an extreme level that there is just nothing but confusion on it and and that's kind of that kind of what uh, got us going with this podcast it, it definitely motivated us to to talk about some of these issues and and where do we start when we go to seek truth? I think that's an incredible story. Yeah. And a, a incredible question. Where do we go when we want to know the truth? And number one, we go to the word of God. We go to the word of God to find truth because the truth is the word of God and every word that's come out of God's mouth. But can I say this to you guys? You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you if you are a believer and in jeremiah 33 3 he says seek me ask me and i will show you things which you do not know you know god tells us to cry out to him and tells us to to clarify things tell us to show what i am to do and that is just so 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 important to do because i believe with all my heart god will reveal to you what what you are to believe and and what is true god does not want us walking in fear and he does not want us walking in darkness when we give our life to the lord i, I feel like there's different stages i mean we probably all of us can relate to that it's like when you give your life to the lord for whatever reason, it stays religion sometimes for a while. We don't really be, get into that relationship of that intimacy with the Lord. And so it becomes, a, it's a workspace kind of relationship. And we feel like, you know, because we're doing really good, God's going to bless us. And if we're doing really bad, God's going to curse us. And that's not God at all. He's just always loving us no matter what. And I, and I think there comes a time in your walk, your spiritual walk, where you finally just say, you know what, God, I'm done being, I'm done living for myself. I'm done with this. I, I am desperate for a, my Savior. I'm desperate for that. And, and it's in that moment, it's in that transformation, it's in that renewing of my mind that I, that I start living my life faithfully for Him. I start understanding what it means to be eternal perspective. And, and the last thing I want to do is take the gifts and the talents that God has given me and to put them under a bushel. You know, I want to be that light. I don't want to, I don't want it to, I don't want to cover it up. I want to be that light to the world, to the darkness. I want to, I want to have the spirit of God flow in me to speak truth to people that are hurting, that are in pain, 
This world is is destroying people's lives. This world is is bringing uh, hopelessness to people. And and we have a message. We have gifts and tools to be able to bring to people to help them walk through this misery that they're going through and to find peace and to find hope and to find love and to find joy. And that is in the name of Jesus Christ. And we have that. And and I, I always I ask the question, if this is you and you're listening to this and and uh, and you are a Christian or a follower of Christ and you're sitting on the sideline and we talked about this in a few podcasts back, but you're sitting on the sideline and you're not out in the game. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would understand and hear what we're saying, that it is that important to get in the game. It's that important to go the extra step. It's that important to start saying, God has given me these gifts. I have to start using them for his glory because there's people that are dying every single day without this hope. And you are being given that tool to be able to do that, to help people. And so Barry, yeah, that, that kind of brings us into that next step. We, we should probably talk about that, the shame aspect. First John 2.28 says, And now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. I mean, just let that seek in. Just let that seek in. If you're a follower of Christ right now and you're sitting on the sideline, you're not utilizing your gifts. You're not utilizing the, the tools that God has given you. That you're, when you enter, you might go to heaven. I mean, there's some that might not go to heaven. I mean, let's just be honest. There's some that go to our church that, that are not going to heaven. They, they're, they're saying, Lord, Lord, but Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But there's some that are, that are fully saved. We know that they're surrendered to the life, but they're not doing the things that God has called them to do. They're not being obedient there. And when you stand before God on this beam of seat, in judgment seat, there's going to be shame. You're going to sit there. He's going to he's going to only talk about the goodness of you. He's going to bring out all the highlights and everything else. But there's so much more that you can do. There's so much more we can give to the Lord. We can give him all of our life. We can give him every aspect of who we are and what we can do. And so that's what God's wanting. I want everything. I want the best of the best. I want the, everything that you have. Give that to me so that I can use it for my glory and to bless you. And so... So there is going to be shame. And um, two, uh, Second John 8, 8 says, Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. When I received Jesus Christ, I have become something new. And what is that? The sin nature uh, was on the throne of my life. It was controlling me. I had no, no way to turn but to turn to sin. And now that... Uh, I have received Jesus Christ and he sits on the throne of my life. I am freed from the bondage and slavery to sin. I am a new creation. So it's, it's like the word in Romans chapter 12, verse two says we are transformed. And that word is metamorpho and it means like the caterpillar and the butterfly. But when we talk about reformation, that is different. That is what we do to change. And, and what, what is that all about? I wrote down a statement here. Reformation is us trying, performing, an act of our will, even discipline to change ourselves. It is only a band-aid, temporary fix. When stresses enter, we are tempted, we go through trials, we will always revert back. All this becomes a endless process of failure and battling with our flesh. With the flesh, we can we try to defeat the flesh. Reformation is is the orange tree uh, shaking, uh, pushing, trying, performing to produce fruit. In my life, I am trying to reform myself. It is a self-help mentality. And and we have had that in the church. Why? Because the church and, and, and myself, I, I can speak to myself and my preaching. We have been about a bunch of do's and don'ts. And that is religious. Yeah. That is not a relationship. And so reformation is us trying to muster up the discipline to live right for God and it doesn't work. When we position ourselves to be in God's presence, we're not going to experience condemnation. We're not going to experience uh, lies. We're not gonna experience hate. We're not gonna experience disappointment. 
We're not going to experience um, things of the past that have brought us down. When we're in God's presence, we're going to experience hope. We're going to have peace. We're going to have joy. We're going to experience a love that's supernatural. And, and when we experience that, there is no way to hold on to our past. All we have is, is, is that goodness, and that allows us to be set free. And so if you're in a cycle in your life where you're, you're not forgiving yourself and you're not, you're not letting go of the past, you're not letting go of that hurt and that, uh, that you've done or, or have done to you, then, then that means that you're not in God's presence. That means that you're not positioning yourself to be close to him. That's, that should be a tall tale sign for you. If you're still dealing with and wrestling with your past mistakes, if you're still dealing with and wrestling with uh, the sin that you've done or, or still believing the lies that you're not worthy enough, then that means that you're not in God's presence because when you're in God's presence, that no longer is an issue. God sets you free from that. God's goodness overwhelms you. God's love can completely makes you speechless. You have no words in his presence. And so and that is that is what God's saying to you right now. And so this is you and this is something that you're dealing with and wrestling with. God is encouraging you now to stop what you're doing. Stop it and just say, God, I repent of this. I repent of the self-centeredness. I repent of wanting to be God of my own life. I surrender to you. Amen. I want to be in your presence. I want to be filled with your holiness. I want to be filled with your love so that in return, you can set me free, but that I can then speak life to other people that are might be dealing with this. And I can be able to be used by God in a supernatural way so that others can know him the way that you are now being known by him. If you're, if you're looking uh, on YouTube, look, look into my eyes here. And maybe you feel today beaten up and you need to be rescued. Can I tell you that there is a force that is ready to rescue you? Amen. God will send his angels. God will send his spirit. God will send his presence and he will not leave you nor forsake you. If you are a child of God, know that he is near and that he cares. Please don't let the enemy say that to you and don't believe the lie that he doesn't care because that is nothing but a lie. What, what if you're here today and you don't know whether or not you're a child of God and you are beaten up, you're, you're frustrated, you're anxious, you don't know where you're going to turn. Well, the first place to turn is to Jesus. Amen. And, and, and I know I've been there. I know you don't feel worthy for anybody to die for you, but Jesus did. And he would die for you a million times over because you mean that much to God. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've gone through, God sees value in you. And he has a plan for you. And he has a purpose for your life. Your life has meaning. But it's got to start with a relationship with him. We've got to acknowledge that we're sinners mm -hmm. and that we don't measure up and that we're the one that's in need and that God sent his son to meet that need, to pay the penalty of our sin. And he died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And by believing that, we realize that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man comes to the Father except through him. Mm -hmm. Have you acknowledged that? Have you asked forgiveness of your sin? Have you believed in Jesus and put in your trust, not in yourself, but in what Jesus did? And have you called upon his name? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. In heaven, on earth, in the spiritual realm, every demon has to bow its knee at the Amen. name of Jesus. Amen. There's power in that name, and it's the only name that can save would you call upon that name right now? Would you pray to him? And would you invite him into your life to be your Lord and Savior right now? Would you pray with me? Dear God, I know that you love me. I know that you have a plan for my life, but I've blown it. Mm. I'm a sinner and I've offended you and I've turned my back on you and I've done it my way and it doesn't work. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. God, I pray that that you would just forgive me of my sins. And I ask in the name of Jesus Amen. that you would uh, believe in Jesus mm. and, and believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And because you believe in Jesus 
and that he's alive and that he's here. Jesus, come into my life right now and save me, rescue me, and help me to get out of this mess, not just to get out of this mess, but to be made whole by you. Come into my life right now and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm telling you, in praying that prayer in your life, the enemy is defeated. And I congratulate you. Amen. You're a child of God. Amen. You have hope for all of eternity. And uh, the enemy is defeated. Amen. Praise God. This has been The Riot Podcast. If you liked what you heard today, please feel free to leave a comment and share it with your friends. See you back here next week for another episode of The Riot Podcast.